thing. You'll see it on the handout that I've given you. You look at it there. That's a psalm. It's set right in the middle of chapter 16 of Chronicles. We're going to look at that psalm. Why is it there? What does it say? Let's pray and commit our time to the Lord. Father, we do thank you for the opportunity to gather together today, to worship together, to study the Word together, to fellowship with one another. Lord, we're so thankful for the blessings of your Spirit that we share in our fellowship. Thank you for your kindness that you've manifested to, to each one, and thank you for a time to to gather together and to reflect on your word. For from your word you give guidance, you give teaching, instruction. And then there we find the precious and very great promises of God. Lord, to apply them in our minds and hearts as we walk with you. We look to take instruction from you and we commit our time to you in Christ's name. Amen. So, in First Chronicles 15, right in the middle, that's where we were last week, and we saw that uh, David brings the ark to Jerusalem. Now, there was a first attempt to bring the ark to Jerusalem that failed because they didn't follow God's <coughs> rules and instruction on how that was to be done. So they had to reset. How they reset? Look at Scripture. <laughs> what did God say? So they did that, and then they proceeded to do it in God's way. And God blessed it. And so David brings the ark into Jerusalem. We know from earlier in 1 Chronicles, he had captured that city. He made that city the capital. And he wanted the ark there to be a place of worship. Isn't that interesting? A capital city of a nation being a place of worship? <laughs> wow. Being the place to worship God. And not only... <clears throat> was this city destined to be the place for the worship of God for that nation, but it was to be the center of an international worship. We're going to see that in the psalm that's before us today. And the prophets pick up on this and project this. So here is the king, the leader, uh, the executive of this country and he wants his capital city to be the place where God is worshipped. So the ark is brought in there and uh, there is a place prepared for it and, uh, and he appoints, he, he appoints Levites to the task of creating a, a worship service, a worship program. You know, there's very logistical things when you have a worship program. You know, it just doesn't happen. <laughs> you have to have organization. And so there's big time organization. And uh, we've got these Levites that are appointed, and we've got a choir, and we've got an orchestra, and we've got uh, singers, we've got um, the various servants doing their various things to assist in the worship as the nation comes together in that capital to worship God. Now in the process he appointed some people that we come to know through the Psalms sort of obliquely, a guy by the name of Asaph. Okay. And you would only know of Asaph if you read this part of 1 Chronicles. Or if in reading some Psalms you happen to read the line that is before verse 1 in some of our psalms. It's very interesting. You just go through, look through the book of psalms, and you see oftentimes, sometimes it's in italics, mm -hmm. or sometimes it's in a smaller font, print. But there's some kind of little introduction, and it'll say on many of them, a psalm of David. And, or it'll say, uh, it'll even give you a setting. David said this psalm in this situation. Or it will say, a psalm of the sons of Korah. Or a psalm of Asaph. This is that Asaph. And this is when he was appointed. He was a cymbal player. <laughs> what we're told here in, in uh, 1 Chronicles 15. He must have been a really good cymbal player. But David recognized that he had other talents. <laughs> and we need to advance him. And so he gets promoted. 
from a cymbal player to a psalm writer and a leader of the whole worship that takes place at the temple. Well, in 1 Chronicles 16, we have a reference to that. Uh, when he talks about uh, these who were appointed, there it is in 1 Chronicles 16, 5, Asaph was the chief, and then Zechariah and some others, and uh, so they were doing their music and all of that. And then <clears throat> right here, starting in verse 7, on that day, David decreed for the first time that thanks be given to the Lord by Asaph and his relatives. And with that, we're into the psalm. Now, this psalm is presented by the chronicler as, on the one hand, typical. So this is where you have, you have just been transported back to the middle of the 5th century B.C. to a service in Jerusalem. Now, the temple's not built yet. The ark is in a tent. David has constructed a kind of a... I don't know, uh, I wanted to say prefab, but that's not exactly right. It's a tent type of structure where the, where the ark is and, and worship is taking place around it. And you've just been transported to that worship service. And, and with all the singing and all the music that comes to this point where this praise is given. I'm going to read it and you can follow along on your sheet or in your Bible. <clears throat> Give thanks to the Lord. Call on his name. Proclaim his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him. Sing praise to him. Tell about all his wonderful works. Honor his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Search for the Lord and for his strength. Seek his face always. Remember the wonderful works he's done, his wonders and the judgments he has pronounced. You offspring of Israel, his servant, Jacob's descendants, his chosen ones. He is the Lord our God. His judgments govern the whole earth. Remember his covenant forever. The promise he ordained for a thousand generations, the covenant he made with Abraham and swore to Isaac and confirmed to Jacob as a decree and to Israel as an everlasting covenant. I will give the land of Canaan to you as your inherited portion. When they were few in number, very few indeed, and temporary residents in Canaan, wandering from nation to nation and from one kingdom to another, he allowed no one to oppress them. He rebuked kings on their behalf. Don't touch my anointed ones or harm my prophets. Sing to the Lord, all the earth. Proclaim his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his wonderful works among all peoples. For the Lord is great and is highly praised. He is feared above all gods. For all the gods of the peoples are idols. But the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and joy are in his place. Ascribe to the Lord, families of the peoples, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory of his name. And bring an offering and come before him. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. The world is firmly established. It cannot be shaken. Let the heavens be glad and the earth rejoice. And let them say among the nations, the Lord is king. Let the sea and everything in it resound. Let the fields and all that is in them exult. Then the trees of the forest will shout for joy before the Lord, for he is coming to judge the earth. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His faithful love endures forever. And say, save us. God of our salvation, gather us and rescue us from the nations so that we may give thanks to your holy name and rejoice in your praise. May the Lord, the God of Israel, be praised from everlasting to everlasting. And all the people said, Amen. Amen. <laughs> and praise the Lord. <coughs> Now, 
This is actually a composite, when we look at it, of three psalms in the book of Psalms. <clears throat> Verses 8 through 22 come from Psalm 105. Verses 1 to 15. Psalm 105, verses 1 to 15. And then, starting in verse 23, going to verse 33, is all of Psalm 96. And then, the last three verses... Verse 34 is from Psalm 106, verse 1. And then verses 35 and 36 are from Psalm 106, 47 to 48, the beginning and the end of Psalm 106. Now, <clears throat> these psalms are interesting in and of themselves, but the chronicler has taken portions of these, and actually what we find when we read the book of Psalms is that sometimes portions of Psalms were reused as they were. And when that's happened, they're, they're put into a different setting. So what we have is a typical worship service that is reflected in some other Psalms as well. But what we want to do is to look at it, how it's presented by the chronicler and what he's trying to say. The psalm begins here with 12 imperatives. And you can underline them here in verse 8. It's give thanks to the Lord. The second imperative is call. Give thanks. Call. The next line. Proclaim his deeds among the nations. The third line, sing to him, then sing praise to him. So there's four imperatives all total. The next line, tell about his wonderful works. The next line, honor his holy name. The next line, let rejoice is really the imperative. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Verse 11, search for the Lord and for his strength. The next line, seek his face always. Number 12, remember the wonderful works he's done. That's 11 imperatives. Where's number 12? All the way down to verse 15. Remember his covenant forever. So it begins with a, a command, a, a call, a summons to worship the Lord. <clears throat> You are to give thanks to him. You are to speak of his deeds. Last week we talked about we talked about praise. What praise is is declaring the 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 character, uh, the attributes, and the works of God. It's speaking them. You actually speak them out loud. You're praising the Lord, speaking them to him as to who he is and what he's done. And this. This speaking becomes proclamation when it's, when it's spoken to one who does not know that. The gospel fits into this. The gospel is a proclamation of good news about what God has done, who he is and what he's done. And that fits into an overall context of praise, speaking about God's works, speaking about who he is and what he's done. Notice that it begins in verse 8 with giving thanks. Now, Paul in the letter to the Philippians uh, has that wonderful verse that many of you have memorized that we're not to be anxious in anything, but in everything with praise and supplication make your requests be made known to God. That's in everything with thanksgiving. Uh, with praise and supplication to make your request known to God. You do it with thanksgiving. You enter his courts with thanksgiving, Psalm 100. Well, when you start talking to God, one of the first things you, that you should know and realize is that you are his creature. <laughs> You're not talking to an equal. I mean, the first thought that when you're speaking to God, you're speaking to the one who made me. 
puts me in the mode of being thankful as my first thought. I'm thankful even to be talking to him. <laughs> I mean, he made me so that I could do this. And so I come with thanksgiving into his presence, my creator, my maker, the one who in his providence cares for me, as well as to a whole history of relationship with him and prayer and answers to prayer. Call on him, verse 8, you give thanks to him and call on his name. Prayer is appropriate for God, calling upon him. And speaking of all that he's done. Whenever when we come to ask God of things, it's helpful to speak of the wonderful works of God. Because what I'm asking and petitioning God for is a work. <laughs> and I'm recalling the wonderful works that he has done. Notice in verse 9, the sing, the singing. It's, I don't know whether in your prayer time you sing or not, it's helpful to have a hymnal with your Bible and uh, to sing to him. You don't have to worry. You don't have to let anybody else hear. <laughs> Just sing to God. It, it sets your heart right. sets your mind right. And that's what we do in the great congregation is we sing. We join into that singing. It's a, appropriate in it. And it's fitting for the Lord. Tell about his wonderful works. Honor his holy name. We honor his name. And we'll say a little more about that name as we go on here. Rejoice in him. And search for him. Seek him. Verse 11. In the book of Chronicles, this is what had not been done at the end of 1 Chronicles 10 with Saul. Here Saul was king for a long time. A lot of things happened. I mean, you have daily activity, you know, over years. You have wars and things going on here, the governing of a kingdom, and it's said at the end of 1 Chronicles 10, he just, he didn't seek God. He didn't seek the Lord. This is uh, David here setting worship in the capital city and the call, and this is interesting, the call to the nation and to the nations is seek the Lord. Search for him. You know, Jesus said, if you seek, you'll find. Search for him. And for his strength, verse 11. See, what we're looking for from God is really action, power. That things be done. Well, what we need to seek, because actually that's what we're called upon, to accomplish things, perform things, do things. When you worship, you seek His strength. Paul said, I can do all things in Him who strengthens me. He has to provide the strength. And if we're doing it with his strength, then we're accomplishing his will. Seek his face always. His face, what they're talking about here in the ancient times, the face is not just the face as a face, but it's a face of favor. Okay. So when we're seeking his face, we're really seeking his favor. It's that, it's that face of royalty that looks kindly. You know, it's very important in a royal situation. What's the expression on the face looking at you? Okay. <laughs> and uh, what we're looking at here is favor. So we seek that favorable face. Remember, verse 12, the wonderful works he's done, his wonders, the judgments he has pronounced. The judgments he pronounced goes back to his word. And this is all, verse 13, a word, a call to worship that's given to Israel. Israel, his servant. Jacob, his descendants, his chosen ones. This is a call to Israel. 
Verse 14, he is the Lord our God. The Lord said, I will be your God and you will be my people. That's what he said at Sinai. <coughs> And that's repeated in the, in the covenant promises. You will be my people. I will be your God. So the proclamation, the Lord, he is our God. And his judgments govern the whole earth. That line is very important because what's coming is set in a context where it's recognized that his judgments govern the earth. What is the standard for the governance of the earth? What is the standard for the governance of the nations of the earth? The standard for, for governance is the, is the Lord. It's his judgments. I think this is very interesting in light of discussion of political philosophy in our day. You know, a very famous, now some of you, <coughs> may have studied political science or may be involved in these kinds of things, but a very uh, prominent, well-known uh, political science theory is that by John Rawls, The Theory of Justice, which is based on a human imaginative action. Say so we're supposed to imagine a, a, an innocent, primitive situation where society is just beginning and imagine what the laws would be that would be good. And then we proceed to try to put that in place. Now that's based on a human imaginative construction. Now, <clears throat> if you don't believe in God, that's all you've got is human imaginative construction. In the history of governance, the, the good thing in the history of that is that a lot of people who were imagining things had a tradition that was influenced by Scripture. And they would think about things that were just and were good from a tradition that had been influenced by God's Word, even if they didn't recognize that, and as time went on, paid less and less attention to it. But things will drift that way, will they not? I was thinking on the way over, interesting, for example, how things drift and change in the culture. Psychologists refer to a, a manual, a diagnostic manual, you know that, At the DSM, <clears throat> the Diagnostic Manual. There's several editions of that. Take the issue of homosexuality for an exa example that in an earlier edition was felt to be abnormal. In the later edition, uh, it's people who think that's wrong are abnormal. Things change as we imagine and based on our imaginative construction. What this is saying is that the principle for governance and the principle for order in the world is God's judgment because he is the everlasting God. His judgments govern all the earth, verse 14. Now we'll come back to that in a moment. Now, verses 15 through 17 is a reference to his covenant. Remember his covenant forever, the promise he ordained for a thousand generations, the covenant he made with Abraham, swore to Isaac, confirmed with, to Jacob as a decree, and to Israel as an everlasting covenant. <clears throat> there are seven words here. Three nouns and four verbs. Covenant, promise, decree. Speaking of the same thing, his covenant, his promise. His decree. His covenant was a covenant of a promise, and he decreed it. It is a decree. Four verbs. He ordained it. He made it. He swore it. He confirmed it. Repetition in Hebrew poetry is a point of emphasis to expand your understanding of it. This covenant is verse 15 forever. The last line of verse 17, everlasting. And what was this 
covenant, promise, decree, which he ordained, made, swore, and confirmed, that is forever, that's everlasting. It is a covenant that he made with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, and then passes on to the descendants of Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel. So you're now in the capital city in Jerusalem, and this, this psalm is being sung, worship is being given, and remember a covenant that he made with us, Okay, Israel is saying. And this covenant is, I will give the land of Canaan to you as your inherited portion. Here we are in Jerusalem. <clears throat> it's in that land. Uh, Israel living in the land, and they are remembering that God said that this land I'm giving to you as your portion. In the chronicler's day, uh, they're living after time where most of the people were scattered out of that land, and some have begun to return, and a new temple has been built. And the people are re-establishing the nation. And they come back to this land. And what they're seeing and what they're understanding when they come back to this land is that God said that I'm giving this to you as your portion. And they're seeing that and realizing that the word of God is sure. See, in verse 14, his Judgments govern the whole earth. You can circle that. But in verse 18, your portion of the whole earth is here. God did not give to Israel the whole earth. He gave them a piece of it. Well, what about the rest of the earth? Acts 17.31, Paul says uh, in Athens, when he's speaking to these Greeks, he says, from one man he made every nation of mankind and appointed their times and the places of their habitations. God has put us on this earth. But he has given a particular portion to Israel. And these who have come back, back into the land, are realizing that, and they're reminded of the surety of God's word. Now, fast forward to our time. <clears throat> and in our time, here we are, 70 years now, going on 71 years since the reestablishment of the nation of Israel in that land. It's very interesting that the Zionist movement as a political movement began, as you know, under the work of Theodore um, Herzl. Herzl. And uh, Herzl was a secular Jew. He, however, at the end of the 19th century, when there were so many nationalist movements that were taking place, uh, had a burden to see, in light of the persecution of Jews, uh, that there be a, a national uh, state of, for the Jews reestablished. In the 1880s in Russia began the pogroms uh, from the Tsar against the Jews. Those were so severe and, attacked, and attracted such international attention that even in the United States uh, there was uh, uh, one who who uh, led the charge, a Christian, uh, who, um, who led the charge to uh, petition the U.S. government and the President of the United States at that time, who was Benjamin Harrison, to call an international meeting of representatives of the nations to consider a reestablishing re a nation for the Jews. This is in the 1890s. And uh, William Blackstone was his name. He was an evangelical Christian. 
And uh, one of the interesting things is he went around talking to various rabbis and so on and Jewish groups and the, you know, he had to convince them and they said, what? <laughs> yeah, a nation for the Jews. I mean, the Bible predicts this, okay? Oh yeah, that's right. Now, <laughs> Herzl, uh, who was leading this movement uh, from a secular standpoint, was saying, you know, we need a nation for the Jews. Where should we put it? Maybe in Africa. You realize it? <laughs> South America is actually considering, you know, maybe in Uganda, you know, maybe a portion of Brazil. And on his doorstep, you know, knocking on his door, shows up this guy named uh, Will uh, Heckler. And Heckler was a Christian. He was actually the chaplain of the British Embassy in Vienna, where Herzl was. And uh, he had for a long time been talking about God's plan and purpose for Israel. And there's a whole group of them uh, because of the London Missionary uh, Society, the London Society for Jewish Missions and so on, working with, also with uh, the Prussian um, uh, Mission Society at that time, a real desire to see uh, God's blessing upon the Jews and had already established a uh, British uh, consulate for, for Jewish people in Jerusalem, going back to the 1830s and 1840s. So <clears throat> Heckler was there in Vienna, associated with the British consulate, and, and really praying for God's blessing upon the Jewish people. And he walks into a bookstore in Vienna and picks up Herzl's book that had just been published in March of 1896. And the book is Der Judenstadt, which is the, the nation of the Jews. And he looks at that. And he's, so he looks up Herzl and knocks on his door. And uh, he says, you know, you wrote this book. Yeah. He says, well, I'm here to help you. He said, what? He says, I'm here to help you. He says, you, you, have, you, have, you understand what is supposed to happen according to scripture <clears throat> but I can help you in terms of making political contacts and so on and the first thing we have to get clear is that it's in Israel okay it's not in Uganda it's not in Brazil okay it's in that land that's what the Bible says so he, uh, Herzl then visits Heckler in the Heckler's apartment and in Herzl's diary he says Heckler's apartment had books everywhere, and especially lots of Bibles, and he had on this table a huge map of Palestine, and he, he's going over all this map and saying, look, here's where this happened, here's where this happened, here's this, and this is where it's to be. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and why is that? Because God said, he made a covenant forever that it's to be there, and in the providence of God, they went there. So the rest is history, how the state formed and the nation came to be and so on. And here they are and uh, they're in that land and uh, you know all the way up to Jerusalem and but there needs to be a recognition of who the Lord is and a worship that is given to him. Again, looking on your, your handout here, and I haven't advanced the slide, so let me go down to this. Uh, when they were few in number, very few indeed, temporary residents in Canaan, wandering from nation to nation and from one kingdom to another, he allowed no one to oppress them, rebuke kings on their behalf, don't touch my anointed ones or harm my prophets. Verse 22 is actually referring to Genesis 20, when uh, Abram, um, Abimelech, had taken Sarah, Abram's wife, and, uh, you know, Abram has said, well, she's my sister. And so, okay, great, I'm going to take her and she's going to be my wife. And then God says, no. And Abimelech says, what? And God says, no, you're not going to do that. And the Lord says to Abimelech, don't harm my prophet. Speaking of Abraham, 
It's the only place in Scripture where Abraham is called a prophet. Well, that's in Genesis 20. In Psalm 105, all this is talking about the way Israel came out of Egypt. They were wandering, you know, and so on. And God didn't allow anybody to oppress them. You know, Moab wanted to. Then Moab goes and hires Balaam. Hey, curse them. And Balaam can't do it because God won't let him. And so he blesses them. And the king of Moab said, why are you blessing them? I hired you, paid you good money to curse them. And he says, well, I can't, you know, I can only do what God lets me do. And he wants to bless them. Okay, so God doesn't allow the nations to persecute them. Isn't that interesting the way God can care for us? And it's oftentimes... We're not always entirely aware of the protection of God. There is a protection that comes with his favor. And these people were incredibly vulnerable. But God protected them in their wandering. Now, this is being read by people reading chronicles now in the 5th century B.C. And they remembered they went to Babylon. They were dispersed there. And yet here they're coming back. Because he protected them. <clears throat> Does that mean they didn't suffer? No, they suffered. But God has a plan for the people. Which will be fulfilled. Here we are in our day. Coming back. They're coming back from places... They've come back from places all over, places where they've been since Babylon and they're coming back and people into a land. Because God intends for that to happen. Now in verse 23, we move into a segment that's really all of Psalm 96. And in this, the way that it's presented in Chronicles, you're moving from a call to Israel. That's verses 8 to 22. Now it's a call to all nations. So this is where we really perk up. Because <coughs> we're one of the other nations. Okay? This is a call to all nations. And the interesting thing is that, see, Jerusalem was to be a place where God was worshipped not only by Israel, but a call to the nations to worship God. <clears throat> Sing to the Lord all the earth, proclaim his salvation day to day, declare his glory among the nations, his wonderful works among all peoples. That salvation, of course, is very important to us because in the story of the Bible, we're on this part of the story where we understand that the salvation extends to individual forgiveness and transformation of lives by the Holy Spirit through Jesus Christ. And so the nations should be proclaiming his salvation, declaring his glory among the nations, his wonderful works among all peoples for the Lord is great and highly praised, feared above all gods, for all the gods of the peoples are idols. But the Lord made the heavens. Now what those verses are requiring is the conversion of the nations. Look, the God in ancient times is the ultimate power that the nation is looking for, or to, in order to succeed that's, you, you turn to your God in order to get the power to succeed, to prosper, to do well. This verse says the gods of the nations are idols. <clears throat> we spent not long ago a good bit of time in Isaiah. Isaiah 41 uh, talks about the, the idols of the nations are little figurines made of metal or wood, and Isaiah was mocking them and says, you know, what did they say? Listen to them, you hold a little idol up to your ear. It's not saying much. <laughs> no, it's not saying anything because it's a piece of stone, okay? It's a piece of metal. There's nothing in there. So here is the psalmist, you know, and the, the word coming from Jerusalem to all the nations, <clears throat> all the other sources the, the sought-out places for power, strength, comfort, provision, care, are nothing. There's only one. 
There's one God. And he's not just Israel's God. He is the maker of the whole world. He is our creator and our maker. And he's to be feared above all. Look, in secularism, <clears throat> it's true, they're not looking to pieces of stone. Some are looking to pieces of metal. It's made in round form and stamped on both sides, okay? Mammoth. <laughs> okay. So, I mean, the economy, the, you know, the power is in the economy. The power is in what? In social forces. The power is in our collective decision. Yeah. The ultimate power is in the Lord. Splendor, verse 27. Splendor and majesty are before him. <clears throat> Strength and joy are in his place. Ascribe to the Lord families of the peoples. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. You know, <clears throat> what people desire from leadership <coughs> is right here. Strength and joy. You know how you could summarize that? You want a leader? What do you want? You want a political leader? You want a leader of an organization? You want a leader? A leader? What you're expecting is strength and joy. You don't want a sad, weak leader. <laughs> you want a strong, joyful one. The Lord has strength and joy in his place. And he gives it to the one who is united with him. Well, <clears throat> verses 29 Ascribe to the Lord the glory of his name. Bring an offering. Come before him. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. You're, you're going to worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Holy means separate. Holiness is the state of being set apart. When God said to Israel, you will be a holy nation, it meant that he was setting them apart for himself and for his use. When we are sanctified by the Holy Spirit, when we put our faith in Jesus Christ, we are sanctified. We're sanctified by the Spirit. We're set apart for God. We belong not to ourselves, but to Him. Holiness is being set apart for His use. Set apart for His glory. The worship has to be in this splendor of holiness, which is a wonderful line. The splendor, the, splen the splendid array, the splendor of which the, the worship takes place. You know, there's lots of singing and there's a choir. We see this in First Chronicles. There are people playing cymbals. <laughs> there are percussionists. There's stringed instruments. There's lots of fanfare, there's pageantry, there's, there's even uniforms and choir robes and all kinds of things. It's all wonderful. It's splendid. But the splendor that God requires in worship is the splendor of holiness. And so you, you worship him in holiness. Well, how do you become holy? Well, we can't of our own power, but by receiving his promise by putting our faith in Christ and having received from him the gift of the Spirit when he says, I will put my Spirit in you, we proceed to attend to his word, to walk with him. Paul says in Ephesians 4, walk with him in a manner worthy of the calling. Well, how do you do that? Well, you attend to his word and put your word in his life, in your life, and it's his spirit that makes that real in your daily walk and character and demeanor and activity. As you seek to walk with him, he sanctifies. And that's how we worship. You can't come to worship with a casual... Oh, what time is it? You know, 
what do I do I like that song you know um, when's lunch uh, you know all kinds of thoughts and so on but to worship him in the splendor of holiness you bring a life that God has formed and you speak his praise and you speak his glory and you give thanks to him and put your petitions before him. Tremble before him all the earth. The world is firmly established and cannot be shaken and why is that? Because God is the creator. You know, <clears throat> a lot of people are worried that an asteroid is going to dislodge and smack us. And, you know, when you look at the, the, when you go out and look at the cosmos, it's actually pretty humbling, isn't it? <laughs> it's uh, very interesting. I don't know, I think sometimes it might be sort of like, um, you know, when Israel sent the spies out and looked at all these giants here, you know, I mean, it's a scary place. And they look out from the earth and, and see all of this, it's incredible. And, you know, here goes some asteroid or something. The question is, is God the creator? God is the creator. And the reason why we haven't been smacked and destroyed is because of him. The reason why we exist on this planet is because of him. And so he has a purpose and a plan. And in our worship, that's what we acknowledge. The reason why the world is firmly established is because of him. People will say, yeah, but after billions of years, the sun is going to explode and burn us all up. Do you know that God created the sun? <laughs> and everything. I think I'll put my trust in him. Let the heavens be glad, the earth rejoice. Let them say among the nations, the Lord is king. The sea, everything in it resound. The fields, all that is in them exult. The trees of the forest shout for joy before the Lord, for he's coming to judge the earth. Note all the particulars here. Because see, Israel is a particular among lots of other nations. And so we were talking about particulars. We got the sea, we got the fields. We got the forest with its trees. The sea is happy and the fields are happy. Why, is, why are the fields happy? Because the sea has not covered them up. You know? I mean, if we have a flood, that kills the fields, right? The reason the fields are happy is because the sea is in its place. And the sea is happy to be in its place. And the forest is in its place. Everything is in its place. And in this psalm, Israel is in its place, and the nations are in their place. And they're not flooding over, you know, one nation to another, trying to gobble it up and this sort of thing. Everything is in its place. And why is everything in its place? Because the Lord is king. Yeah, but, yeah, but the history of mankind is nations gobbling up other nations and that sort of thing. Well, that's that last line, verse 33. There's a lot of rejoicing because he's coming. And he's coming to judge the earth, all of it. And he will set it right. You know, he's patient. That's what he said to Israel after, you know, they sinned at Mount Sinai. And, and uh, he... Uh, told Moses, I will destroy them all. And Moses pled with him not to do that. And, um, and so the Lord revealed his glory to Moses, which is really a re revelation of his attributes. He spoke of himself to Moses. And we might paraphrase it by saying, the Lord said to Moses, this is something you need to know about me, Moses. Slow to anger. Abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. But by no means will clear the guilty. Slow to anger. Abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Forgiving. 
transgression and iniquity of sin, but by no means will clear the guilt. There will be justice. But God is slow to anger. And in that slowness to anger, that patience, we live. Aren't you glad he's slow to anger? And with that patience, <clears throat> we come to know him. To know him in his mercy and his grace. But he is coming to judge. The psalm ends with two lines or two parts of Psalm 106. Uh, Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His faithful love endures forever. In uh, later in 1 Chronicles, this is what Asaph was appointed to say. This is the theme of the worship in Jerusalem. This is what they, this is the line, the byline. We see this in some of our, our songs that we sing in our service here. <clears throat> Give thanks to the Lord. He is good. His faithful love endures forever. And then you see this in verse 35, and say, this is very interesting. So kind of break from the psalm a little bit. And there is this addition, and say this also. And this goes at the end of Psalm 106. Say this. Say, save us, God of our salvation, and gather us and rescue us from the nations. Psalm 106 was a post-exilic psalm. It was penned after the exile, and it's about restoration. And so the chronicler has the worship in Jerusalem saying, Gather us from the nations, Lord. You are the God of our salvation. Gather us and rescue us so that we may give thanks to your holy name and rejoice in your praise. That's the purpose of Israel as a people. That's the purpose of the nation is to give thanks to your holy name and rejoice in your praise. And all of the nations of the earth are called to do the same. May the Lord, the God of Israel, be praised from everlasting to everlasting, as is his covenant. So he is himself the everlasting God, and he is to be praised, and there will be worship that is everlasting. And it's to that that the people say amen, amen. and praise the Lord. Now this is what... This was the focus of worship in Jerusalem. In the time of David, this is what they were saying. This is what the chronicler said after the exile and all the sin and destruction of the nation and God brings them back. This is where we re need to reset our worship to this point. <clears throat> Israel's coming back into the land today. There is a need to reset worship to this point. We are peoples of various nations who have come to know God's salvation, which has been given through Jesus Christ. And we are to exemplify that call that was given to the nations to worship the Lord, the Creator and Maker, in whom is holiness and justice and life everlasting. That's our call. And that's what this worship is to be about. We have a couple of minutes, and so you may have some comments or observations or thoughts that you would like to share as we come to the end of our time. Yeah. Earlier you were talking about uh, the political conflict and confusion among the nations because they have rejected God, basically, they're not following his order. Mm -hmm. And I thought of this verse in Psalm 10319. It encourages me a lot, particularly when I look out in the world, read the newspaper, and that kind of thing. It says, The Lord has established his throne in the heavens, and his sovereignty rules over all. So no matter what's going on out there, that God's still in charge and he's got control over all the political parties and everything else that's going on. He's the one we have to. Yes, that's very good. Uh, that's Psalm 103. 103, 19. 103, 19. Very good. Thank you, Ed. I've got a couple of scriptures. Genesis 2 7, the <coughs> law, the brother of God. Isaiah 56 7, my house we call a 
picture, yeah, my house would call the house of prayer for all peoples and all nations. That's yes. salvation for the world. That's exactly right. That's where you're coming from. And yeah. Deuteronomy eight, no, Deuteronomy eight eighteen. God gives you the power to get wealth. You have, you're hitting all over, yeah. and this is reinforcing it. That, excellent. There's, and the point about that, that that was to be a place of worship for all nations. nations. And all, all, all nations and all Jesus. people. Two different tra they translations, but they're both correct. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Excellent. Barbara. <laughs> well, then we here in America, Christian America, uh, we can claim these promises to Israel not for. Right now, especially, um, I'm thinking of uh, this. Save us, O oh God, of our sons of salvation. Gather us together and deliver us from the Gentiles. You know, the secular Gentiles. We are Gentiles, but we're a Christian nation. So I'm asking you, can we claim these promises? What this? Why are we not claiming these promises and rebuilding our nation? Well, I do think that what we have in here, what we're seeing specifically, we see it, you know, as it's given and, and what it's specifically related to. And here is Israel praising God for what he's done for them as a nation. But then you move in the middle to all the nations, where it's sing to the Lord all the earth. And all the nations come and they, they, they rejoice in God. The... Um, the scriptures say that God has appointed all of the nations. And so all of the nations, you know, Jesus said in Matthew 28, make disciples of all of the nations. Disciple all of the nations. So all of the nations are to be worshiping and praising God. It's not just, I think the challenge, is, is a twofold challenge here. One is that a lot of people think of the whole thing is merely an individual, personal thing. Well, it has to be a personal. And that's where salvation uh, is received personally. But, it, but our lives are manifest on a corporate national level as well. And God intends to have that. Um, the Acts 17 passage where Paul says in Athens, you know, he, he appointed from one, he, Pointed one man and from one man all the nations, not just all the people, but all the nations. And the nations are to rejoice in the Lord and worship God. So your question is, well, can we pray that last part of the psalm, save us? Uh, yes, we can as a nation. Uh, we can apply that to ourselves. Although even though there was no covenant given to us, as a nation, like it was given to Israel. But God favors the nations and intends to have them inhabit all of the earth, and they do so acknowledging him as the Lord. And so national challenges, national problems, national threats, and so on, should be taken to the Lord. And the history of our nation, that's what's been done up until recent times. Um, and I know we're past time, but I just have to say this. <laughs> uh, you know, it's very interesting. If you'd look back, you can find these in print. The speeches, the Thanksgiving proclamations of the American presidents going back to George Washington. These have been published. And Washington was the one who called the nation to set aside a day of Thanksgiving to thank God for the protection of our nation with the threats, the military threats that we endured. Lincoln did the same thing. Others have, have other presidents have called the nation to thank God and a day of Thanksgiving was set aside, eventually made a national holiday to do that. And just very recently, <clears throat> I have in mind a presidential proclamation, not the current one, but a presidential proclamation that was given that called the nation you know, as a typical, well, we need to do a Thanksgiving proclamation, and so we're going to call the nation a Thanksgiving, but there's no mention of God. <laughs> so we're supposed to be thankful, but see, thanks is given to somebody. You're not just thankful generally. You're thankful to someone, and it only makes sense if you're thankful, 
to identify the one to whom you're thankful. Which is vertical. Okay. Okay. So at any rate, it's a long answer to your question, but yes, we as a nation give thanks to God, the one and only God who is over all the nations and to whom and whom we come to know, especially in grace, as individually as a people, we come to receive and recognize his salvation given to us in Christ Jesus. Well, let's pray together. We'll be on our way today. Father, do we do thank you. We pray that you would guide us with wisdom and help us in our worship to worship you in the splendor of holiness. Let our words, our lives, our deeds be pleasing to you. And Lord, we acknowledge that you are the Lord. You created everything and your purpose is sure and is enduring forever. Give us wisdom to align our ways, our thoughts, our purposes with yours. And we pray for your blessing and that you would be honored in it. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. That's